Hi, this is Amir Ali Alibhai from the Aga Khan Museum. Welcome to Sundays with the Aga Khan Museum. And uh, our first episode in this series is called Remastered. That's the name of an exhibition that just opened at the museum and where we have the opportunity now to hear Dr. Michael Chagnon, the curator of the exhibition, give a brief overview of this exhibition, which you can visit in person or on our website, our Museum Without Walls. Enjoy. Hi, my name is Michael Chagnon, and I'm curator at the Aga Khan Museum. I'd like to welcome you today to Remastered, our fall 2020 exhibition. Remastered will be on view at the Aga Khan Museum through March 21st, 2021. Remastered was inspired by the current moment that we find ourselves in, in a time when the global COVID-19 pandemic has really driven a lot of people to seek solace in the arts, in their loved ones, uh, and within themselves. What we wanted to do was look inward at the museum's extraordinary collection to find works of art that speak to the common human need to find courage in moments like this, to find love amongst each other, and really to look at the past for models of how to behave and to be human in the present moment and into the future. The exhibition features 11 stations, each focusing on an individual manuscript from the Persian, Turkish, or Mughal Indian traditions. These 11 stations are divided into three themes, courage, love, and exemplary living. When we were going through our collections to select objects for this exhibition, we wanted to find works that really spoke to these themes that connect us both to our deepest past as humans, but also to our present and as we think forward into the future. We also wanted to find works that truly exemplify the extraordinary quality of the collection here at the Aga Khan Museum. So what you'll see when you come through are just exemplary works of Islamic painting through the ages. For the exhibition, the Aga Khan Museum partnered with Ryerson University Library to create immersive digital engagements with manuscripts and paintings from the collection, bringing a 21st century perspective onto 15th to 17th century works of art. These digital interventions offer new ways of seeing and understanding illustrated manuscripts, activating their pictures through motion, expanding them into three dimensions, adding layers of context and interactivity, and even reversing the passage of time. The first section of the exhibition is called The Courageous Spirit, and here we wanted to highlight the different forms of heroism that you encounter in the Islamic literary and visual traditions. One of the paintings that we showcase here is from the Shah Tamasp Shahnameh. One of the ways that many of us have come through this crisis is by finding solace in loved ones. Love in its many guises has been one of the most enduring preoccupations in human history. The Islamic world's literary and artistic traditions have explored the theme of love with great emotional depth and great ingenuity. The second section of the exhibition focuses on this theme of love, of our connection to one another in both its pains and its pleasures. When we find ourselves confronted by difficult tasks or decisions, we can sometimes look to the wisdom of the past and seek answers. This section of the exhibition features illustrated manuscripts of advice literature, whether they're fables or mirrors for princes, which is a literary genre that provides advice for wise rulership to burgeoning young leaders. The lessons transmitted in these manuscripts remain relevant today when ethical behavior, good governance, and illuminating insights can help us navigate world-shaping challenges. We have interactions where we invite visitors to delve further into the paintings with their individual handheld mobile devices to explore highlighted figures, sounds, texts, and objects. Some of the paintings have been animated, where we activate these illustrations to create a visually dynamic effect. 
It's comparable to the viewing experience of these lustrous paintings by flickering candlelight centuries ago. Several of the paintings on view have been translated from two dimensions into three dimensions using holographic displays. This enhances our comprehension of the spatial logic in Persian, Ottoman, and Mughal painting. Lastly, we worked with our partners at Ryerson University Library to digitally restore damaged works of art to approximate how these illustrations looked when they were originally completed. I think this exhibition has a little bit of something for everybody. If you miss a traditional museum experience because you've been isolated at home during the COVID crisis, this is definitely an exhibition for you. We've put on view some of the greatest masterpieces in the Aga Khan Museum collection, and you really have uh, an immersive experience and a, a unique experience with these works of art. If you're interested in digital technology on the cutting edge, the four intervention types that we offer here will really grab you and bring these works of art to life. What I hope people take away from this exhibition is that works from the past really do remain relevant today, and that we can look to these works not only to find enjoyment and pleasure, and perhaps even a form of escape, but really to learn something as well about our own selves as humans. Our second segment is an excerpt from a performance by Kia Tabassian and Amin Onari. These are two artists who we actually have a long history with here at the Aga Khan Museum. Both of them performed in our first season. Amin was in fact one of the first artists to ever perform on our stage, so it's great to have him back. And in the spirit of the exhibition, the remastered exhibition that looks at Persian paintings, what we've done is uh, presented classical uh, music by these two musicians from Persia. Uh, if you have a chance to see some of the uh, images that are in the exhibition, you will see musical instruments depicted in many of them. And so you might recognize even the instruments that both these artists are playing, which is the sitar and various percussion instruments, including the daf from the Persian classical tradition. These two artists are masters in their own right. Please enjoy.
I love Kia and Hamin. I think Hamin is one of the most amazing percussionists. And Kia, his sitar playing is incredible. So I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Our next segment is taking a look at uh, the exhibition again. And I had the opportunity to meet up with uh, Dr. Chagnon in the galleries and the exhibition, where we had a chance to go a little bit deeper into some of the reasons why the exhibition was developed in the way it has, and especially in the light of uh, our global pandemic. What is that like? So please enjoy this conversation, and then I'll be back to introduce the last segment. Hi, Michael. Hi, Amir. How are you doing? Good. It's good to see you. Very good to see you. We don't, we don't get to do this hardly enough these days. That's right. On the screen most of the time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this exhibition has opened within the context of all of this. Of, yeah. You know, and I'm, I've been thinking about how that must have been like to put together an exhibition through, you know, restrictions on how close you can be to people. Um, and you know, I was hoping to talk a little bit with, with you about that whole experience uh, today. But I wanted to start off by asking you about the objects that you've had a chance and uh, an opportunity to work with in this exhibition and to talk about maybe that piece or those pieces that uh, you know, gave you goose flesh when you, when you handled them the first time or, or had a chance to see them out of a case. Yeah, there's uh, the there's so many pieces in the collection that are just uh, stunning, and so anytime you get to see them outside of a vitrine, outside of a case, to see them unwrapped, uh, it's uh, it does give you that moment of arrest. Uh, I think in this show, I worked very closely with one manuscript in particular um, because we had to do quite a bit of research on uh, its individual components. This is Anbaris Soheli, uh, which is a manuscript dated to the, uh, 1593. Um, and it's a very important manuscript because uh, it contains both its owner's name and an indication that this owner, Sadiq Beg, who was an artist and a librarian, actually illustrated the book it, himself. He's a very prominent figure in the study of Persian art history. So to have uh, sort of firsthand, literally firsthand experience with this manuscript as a sort of link to history in, in a way was uh, humbling, we'll say, to say the least. Um, and then just from a visual perspective, the, the uh, manuscript of um, the Negaristan in our collection which uh, has this outstanding lacquer binding um, that in and of itself is this jewel um, in which we sort of call from to create uh, a lot of the visual motifs that you find throughout the exhibition. Uh, that is a very special object in its own right. And it reminded me that manuscripts aren't just texts and they're not just individual paintings. They actually are holistic objects, which is something that I hope comes through in the exhibition. That that experience, that live experience, is something I think so many of us are yearning for right now, that actual in encounter with another human being, um, or that, uh, that, that experience with, with something that isn't on a screen. Mm -hmm. I know for me, I yearn for that quite a bit, and, and I believe a lot of people are, are, are feeling that way as well. But we've also become very used to experiencing uh, works, um, uh, artwork, performances, exhibitions, paintings, um, through the medium of our screens or our phones. And so, you know, part of this whole remastered strategy, you know, which I think is brilliant, by the way, has been to use technology as a way to take a fresh look at the works that are in the, in the exhibition that you've curated. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the actual you know, technology, what was that like, developing that? And what motivated you to, 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 uh, to go that route with this exhibition? Well, it was, it was interesting that we, it was an interesting challenge in one sense that when I was asked to put together this exhibition based on our permanent collection, because we have to take so much into consideration when we, we show things. We want to ultimately preserve the longevity of these objects so that future generations, we're custodians of a collection, and we have to ensure that future generations will be able to experience them and enjoy them as much as we are today. 
uh, manuscripts in particular, which is a lot of our collection, are light sensitive. And so we uh, have to rotate them in our permanent collection gallery, the objects in our collection, very often, every six months. And to build a show based on this material presented challenges because we didn't want to exhaust the collection. So we had to be very judicious about how we selected objects for the show. And that was really the, that very practical um, situation was what gave us the idea to think of how we can use digital technology to dive into manuscripts with greater depth, with greater clarity, with a greater understanding of their original context, oddly enough, you know, using cutting edge technology to really reconstruct the original experience as much as possible. These are all things that I wanted to accomplish in this show, and I think in partnering with Ryerson University Library, which developed the, the digital content in this exhibition in consultation with us, in collaboration with us, uh, we managed to hit on four really interesting ways, pathways to experiencing the manuscripts beyond their physicality, their, their actuality. So we have interactive uh, technology where we use, you, you can use your own handheld device to scan QR codes and highlight individual elements within paintings, sounds, words, uh, objects, uh, and link to broader fields of knowledge. Um, so you have a really more in-depth experience with an individual illustration. We also have some of the folios animated to give us some sort of sense of the vitality, the vivacity of these paintings um, as experienced originally by candlelight with their very uh, highly polished surfaces and metallic pigments. They would have glittered and almost moved uh, originally. So we've uh, very playfully created some, uh, I think, animations that give us a, a modern or contemporary take on that, uh, that sort of awe that you can feel from a picture. Uh, some of the uh, paintings have been rendered in three dimensions using holographic technology um, so that you can understand the space in the pictures a lot more easily. Um, space in Persian painting, in Ottoman painting, Mughal painting is sometimes difficult to decipher. And it can become a barrier if you're not familiar with the tradition. And so this is a show all about removing barriers to having greater access to manuscripts, greater understanding of the stories, how they're relevant to this moment that we're living in. So we thought this would be a good way to help, uh, help visitors understand space in these pictures. Uh, and then lastly, and I think very importantly, uh, we took very damaged pictures in the collection and restored them digitally by taking elements from the same manuscript and sort of uh, tracing them out, pasting them in, and creating really very delicate um, interpretations ultimately. We don't know what they would have looked like originally, but um, interpretations of what they may have looked like originally, uh, bringing them back to life in a sense. I mean, I think it's really interesting, very often, that role of mediation is, is, a, is a role that institutions and curators play when it comes to access to works of art. And what I heard you say that I, I think is a really important thing these days is access. Yeah. Uh, we have likely people who are watching us uh, speak to one another right now who are living all over the world. Many of them, even if there weren't a, a global pandemic happening, uh, would likely not have an opportunity to see this exhibition, which is up you know, until uh, Navarro's of uh, 2021. And how are, can people experience this exhibition in other ways, online, because you've spoken about this mediation within the gallery, mm. but um, it would be good for people to be able to know how they might be able to access some of the content you just described in another way. Absolutely, we're working assiduously toward getting a 3D um, experience of the exhibition online so that you can actually walk through the gallery on your computer uh, and zoom into uh, different cases, different images, uh, and really see up close and in space in three dimensions what the gallery looks like and, and feels like. Uh, so that will be forthcoming, it'll be interactive, so you can, um, again, experience all of the different, different interventions that we've developed for the exhibition. Uh, and we're also uh, developing a unique 
website just for the exhibition, which will be interactive. And this will really be how the exhibition lives on past Noru's of 2021. Um, and will be online for, for people to experience long into the future. Uh, so uh, we're, we really do want to um, make this as open an experience as possible. Even if you can't come to our museum in Toronto, you'll be able to experience it from wherever you are in the world. You know, one of the things that's happened for us institutionally since um, this pandemic has uh, impacted our way of working and our lives and the way people consume and have access um, is to think more, you know, about how people around the world can, can, can gain um, access to what we do and, and what we do um, becomes a, a resource. So I love that idea that it sits on our website for, for, uh, for people to be able to come back to uh, after the exhibition has come down. Because in the past, I suppose we would have had catalogs um, yeah. that would have served that purpose. But this, this kind of richer and perhaps more accessible way of disseminating um, and, and keeping that, you know, the thought to this work that you do as a curator, which can be so ephemeral at times, because again, not even every exhibition has a catalog, right? right? right. So um, this idea of the real and the unreal, it's become such a question during these times. And I was wondering Absolutely. if you had a chance to think about, well, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that, you know, we're museums, we're in the preservation business. The idea is to, to preserve knowledge, uh, to preserve uh, knowledge embodied in objects, uh, histories embodied in objects, cultures embodied in objects, and to be able to keep these sorts of narratives that exhibitions tease out. You know, they're very specific. Each exhibition tells a story. To keep that story alive is very important, as you mentioned, in exhibition catalogs or in a digital format. The digital format, of course, the, the, the uh, online experience can be, is much more democratic in a sense because everyone can have access to it. So that, uh, that was really important for us. And as we move forward, what we're experiencing is the people are engaging with museums in multiple ways now. It's not just the sort of, um, the wonderful ritual of coming to a museum, to being in a space like this. Um, it's also about being able to access this these days by necessity from home uh, for many people, but um, even just as a way to sort of become uh, more immersed in that experience. Having an online presence for museums is so important because it helps you extend that experience on site to your day-to-day -day life, potentially. Um, we don't want to create barriers around knowledge. We want to yeah. promote knowledge, and this is a really effective way to do that, of course. Um, so the two are working, you know, the on-site and the online are working together uh, to, to make sure that people have access to what we're producing. And you know, finally, I wanted to to ask you about you know clearly this is this is an exhibition of masterpieces of work by masters, and uh, this mediation kind of remasters them the same way we use that language around uh, music, you know, old exactly. recordings that are re remastered for distribution. But you've had to do this exhibition under you know, and you mentioned this at the beginning under. Can, circumstances that are not typical. Um, and I'm wondering if, if you could talk about what that was like. I could never have anticipated having to curate a show largely over Zoom, you know, it's just, or, or, or Teams or whichever platform you're using. Uh, you know, bringing a show together like this is intensely collaborative work. It's done by a team. It's not done by a single person or even three people. It's, a, you know, everyone uh, who has their um, own area of expertise from our exhibitions department, conservation, curatorial, uh, performing arts was involved uh, with this exhibition as well. Um, everyone contributed to it and we did it all remotely until the last essentially week when we were installing it. Uh, there were moments that I could come into the conservation lab to examine something, um, but this was almost conducted entirely remotely. And it was, um, 
I'll say that it wasn't the, the uh, immediate experience that you have when you're putting a show together, when you're meeting with your colleagues and talking to them face to face and you have this really intense sort of moment, a series of aha moments. It was different than that, but what on the flip side happened is that when the last two weeks, the last week happened and we were all here in the space putting this show up, it went by, it, it, it came off very smoothly and everyone was just so full of joy and energy to be together again yeah. and to experience actual art again and to see this project that had been sort of realized in our heads and on screens actually happen in three dimensions in actual space. And it was, uh, it was like a skyrocket. You know, it was an incredible moment to see it come together. And, you know, it was very fulfilling. And hopefully that is translated to the visitor experience either on site or on our website when, uh, when it becomes available there. Yeah, I mean, what's really clear from talking to you today is that mother is, in, you know, that, that um, necessity indeed is the mother of invention. Yeah. And um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And I think that um, I'm looking to the, today's my first day seeing the live exhibition, so I'm going to take some time and, and spend, uh, to spend with the works that are here physically. And um, I'm also going to check out all the virtual content because I think that um, um, that's another way to, to, to keep uh, exploring the works that are, that are here. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to walk through with you if you, uh, if you let me. I would love that. Very good. Okay. Hi, I'm very excited about sharing this next piece of content. We had the chance to work with the Aga Khan Museum program recently to present Aga Khan Music Masters. And in this concert that was uh, aired online in November, we were able to present the work of some of the master musicians that have been working over the years with the Aga Khan Music program. And, uh, We've excerpted from the original concert, and if you want to see the whole thing, you can visit our website and see the whole concert. So please enjoy this content. I think you'll be quite blown away by the diversity of artists and the way in which they're able to work together and collaborate across cultural differences. Please enjoy. And camera set. Do I do it again? Okay. Welcome to Aga Khan Master Musicians Concert. It's feeling, it's, it's our blood, it's our music, and it's our culture. Okay, it's improvised. I feel that it has my energy. This is very important. <laughs> Let the music brighten your day ahead. The first piece is my pipa solo, Dance of the Yi People. Pipa is a very old Chinese traditional instrument, was introduced to China 2,000 years ago from Central Asia. And Dance of the Yi People is one of the most popular contemporary pipa work.
Yule dance, it's a piece of, actually the inspiration uh, came from the folk music, uh, Swedish folk music. Because uh, now I'm living in Sweden, I studied in the university there and we had a concert together during our study, our uh, master in the university. Uh, so at that time I decided to compose something uh, not similar because I did the seven or eight beat, which is not traditional in Swedish folk music. But in the middle, I put two on four, I changed the beat. So you can, you can hear it's kind of dance, it's kind of not my, it's not from my culture, not from my, it's very far, but I start to get these uh, influences. Thank you. 
here comes another my piece. I arranged this piece from a very popular Uyghur folk tune. It's called Sending You a Rose. So I call this piece called Rose. <laughs>
Well, that's it for our first episode called Remastered. Uh, we're going to be presenting a fresh episode each month on the first Sunday of each month. Hope to see you again and uh, be safe and take care, everyone. Bye for now.